Okay, everybody, we're going to go ahead and uh, kick it off now. It's about 11.35, 1.35 Central. Um, we'll just jump right into it. Uh, we see some questions coming on the right-hand side. Um, again, feel free to start posting as many questions as you want. Um, we'll get to those either throughout the webinar or at the end of the webinar. Um, so today, how to re reduce subscriber churn. I'm Jesse Richardson. My blog is jesserichardson.com, and I'm here with Mr. Morris. Hey, I'm Jameson. Um, I also read about my blog, jamesonmorris.com. Today we're focusing on uh, how to reduce subscriber churn. Um, last week, um, or two weeks ago, we did a webinar on uh, how to get your first 25 customers. Um, in our opinion, uh, retention and churn are, are oftentimes even more important than customer acquisition. Um, it's much easier to hold on to a customer than it is to get a new one. Um, so we're going to be covering um, a lot of good foundational stuff, as well as um, some of the, the tools and tricks that we use for our own subscription businesses to keep churn down. Um, and uh, yeah, let's let's get going here. So so yeah, as, as Jameson mentioned, um, you know, churn and retention can be just as important as customer acquisition. And so in that in that respect, we're going to be looking at a couple different strategies for reducing churn um, and increasing retention. And we'll define those two terms too. So if those terms are confusing, just just hold tight. Um, they'll be proactive and reactive things. So things that you can do ahead of time to prevent people from churning, and as well as things you can do after people are trying to churn or after they've churned. Um, a big part of this is emphasizing customer service and the life cycle of the customer. So really understanding um, the customer's journey um, and what point they're at in their journey and understand those things when you're dealing with those customers and, and then um, you know, providing, th providing things for those customers at different stages that incentivizes them to either come back as a customer or stay as a customer. Um, and of course, like all of our webinars, you'll be provided with an action item list to get you started on some things um, for reducing churn. Uh, I think we got about six different things for you guys to do today, um, so uh, it'll be quite a bit. Um, we thought we'd just start here with a, a quick quote about the mentality you should have uh, when you're thinking about churn and, and customers. Um, you know, it's you can read this quote. Um, it's by a uh, customer service guru, Peter Shankman, and basically it's saying that um, you know it's it's the tiny things that reinforce customer loyalty. A lot of brands. Um, We'll focus on just a few critical touch points um, when it comes to customer interactions, like when they receive the product or the checkout process or, you know, some, some specific point in the customer journey. But what really makes up a customer's loyalty is, is a lot of different tiny things, um, the different interactions they have with your business, whether they're just emailing you about something about shipping or, you know, when they, um, you know, their card gets declined and if they get notified about that, it's, it's kind of all these different tiny points in the customer's journey. Um, that can really reinforce their loyalty to your customer or, or to your product. Um, yeah, you'll notice the first few slides here um, are pretty heavy on customer service best practices. Um, what we've seen in many of our subscription businesses, I mean, all of them, is that customer service has played a huge role in uh, in churn and retention. Um, just being really responsive, thoroughly addressing their their uh, inquiries. Um, going above and beyond. I mean, that sounds kind of like cliche, but it actually is like so important. Um, it's crazy how much that actually affects um, uh, the retention of the business. Yeah, and part of that is because too, we got to remember that we're we're running subscription businesses. It's not a traditional e-commerce business where we have this single interaction with the customer once in a while. These people have subscribed. Um, they're getting a product every single month, or maybe every two months, or three months, or something. Um, but it's it's this ongoing relationship with the customer. Um, that's one of the really great things about the business because you get access to more revenue that way. But it's also one of the things you got to think about when dealing with customers and in different interactions. I mean, these aren't normal types of customers that are walking into businesses. These people really like your business and they're loyal to it. Um, and so, customer service is is really important. Um, so to start. If, if you haven't created something like a Zendesk, there's lots of other applications for this, desk.com. Um, uh, there's there's a couple of the ones I can't think off the top of my head. I, I think Jameson and I prefer Zendesk. It's really easy to use. Um, if you if you haven't made something like this before, make a point to do this right now. Just go to Zendesk.com, um, create a Zendesk account. Basically what this is, is um, it's a portal for you to manage your customer emails. Uh, there's eight different channels that can be tied into Zendesk. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, email, phone, chat, um, a bunch of different things. And it makes it easy to sort, to manage, and to work through different uh, tickets. And when we say tickets, all we mean is emails. emails. Um, um, uh, uh, so, so, me, me. Sorry about that. Yep, looked like, our, looked like our webinar crashed there. Let's go ahead and head and get back to presenting. 
Okay, so um, where we were at, we were talking about Zendesk. Um, so Zendesk is a customer service portal um, uh, that allows you to sort your tickets and your chats and your and your voice calls. Um, so take a moment, go to Zendesk.com. Um, it's really easy. If you're using a current email address to um, to manage your uh, your your customer service. So if you're working through Gmail or, or something like that, um, you can use that same email address. So it might be you know support at uh, you know specialbox.com or help at whatever your brand is dot com. Um, you can connect that directly to your Zendesk. So you'll receive the emails that you would otherwise receive in that in that inbox in the Zendesk um, platform, and then you'll be able to sort through those tickets. And I'll show you um, my my Zendesk that I use for Prosperly. Um, that kind of give you a sense of how it's set up and just some basic things about it. Um, so if you just rejoined us, um, the whole to the go whole go to webinar control panel just crashed for all of us. So we're sorry about that. Um, we're just going to catch up from from where we were. Um, if you did ask any questions, um, uh, please re ask them since uh, it looks like everybody's questions were deleted. Um, Thanks for everybody's comments. It looks like we got a lot of people LOLing about the whole crash. Um, oopsies. Um, so if you did ask questions, we didn't we didn't get a chance to look at them. So uh, please ask them again in the, in the right hand panel, and we'll definitely get to those. Okay, so let's move on here. So what is churn? What is retention? Jameson, why don't you explain what churn is? Yeah, so churn is the amount of customers that uh, that cancel or leave uh, each month, and that's usually how we measure them with a monthly subscription business. Is is month over month churn. Um, Retention is uh, the exact opposite. Um, retention is the amount of people you're holding on to every month. Yeah, so churn and retention are usually calculated in percentages rates. So, for example, um, you know, you can look at this bottom example here. If you have 100 subscribers and you churn 12 of those subscribers, as in 12 people cancel that month, um, then you have a churn rate of 12%. That's very simple math. And, I mean, it would just be the number of subscribers that, that cancel divided by your total numbers total number of subscribers for that month's period. Um, so why does it matter? Uh, because churn is the biggest threat to your business in a lot of different ways. The more customers you lose, the more customers you have to find in order to stay at the point you already were at. And that means in order to grow, you have to find even more customers. So if you lose 12, you need to find at least 12 more customers just to get back to where you were. Um, and in order to grow, you got to find 13, 14, 15, or you know, 24, hopefully. Um, so churn is really important. So this isn't th something that you should consider like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll do my customer service stuff later, or I'll think about this thing down the line. The more time you take now to set up the infrastructure to reduce churn, uh, the better it's going to be for your business. Um, so someone already asked this already. Uh, you know, what is an industry standard for churn rate? Uh, it's, it, it varies. So, you know, we've got three different categories here, good to best, um, cost for concern, and the bad bad section. And this might look pretty wide for you, especially the first one, 5 to 10, 15%. There's an entire, you know, 10% there. Um, we've seen the best subscription businesses, you know, float between 8, 12, maybe even up to 15%. I mean, that's about what, what I think both of us see in our businesses right now. Um, you know, less than 8 or 5% is obviously great, but we don't see that very often. Um, you know, it depends a lot. Um, you know, on, their, on your price point, even if you have a very low price subscription, some people might just forget about it. So it kind of depends, but this is a good range. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it also really depends on, on your niche, too. I mean, some inherently will always have higher churn. Um, you know, we usually see that with, like, the candy subscriptions. Those usually have higher churn. Um, so that's why it's even more important if you're just getting started to create a product that people, you know, receive um, or perceive as a recurring need. Um, and that's why we always recommend, you know, mm -hmm. going even more niche and really finding the perfect audience for your product. Um, cause that's going to result in, um, you know, a better, um, default sort of retention in your business. Yeah. And you can see that too, under the comment we put here under the bad section, I mean, that is going to be over 20%. If you're losing, you know, a fifth of your subscribers each month, there's going to be, there's probably something seriously wrong. Um, and the issue might be, maybe it's too high of a price point. Maybe it's an uncompelling product offering, or maybe it's some other more systemic issue you have in your business. Yeah. I mean, and sometimes you can see a high churn coming. Um, you know, if you're running like promotions or you did a, a Groupon campaign or you, you, you know, one month you had extra inventory, so you're offering like a crazy discount, like 40% off. Um, those are always going to result in higher churn. Um, you know, with my business, when I, if I'm, if I'm having a month where I'm doing a big promotion or I'm doing a deeper than normal discount, um, I anticipate higher churn, so I'll I'll go I'll do extra things that month to make sure that I'm holding on to more of those customers. Um, so it, you know, it, 
sometimes you can see 20% and you know why, but mm -hmm. if you're just normally seeing something like 20%, then it could be an issue with your product may not be the right fit for your audience. Um, you know, maybe the, maybe you're not spending enough time procuring product and your boxes aren't that great. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's a few things to look at, but yeah. And one, one of the things you can do too, just as a quick comment about that is, um, you know, if in a given month you're doing a special promotion for a, a group of customers that you uh, assume are going to churn at a higher rate, one of the things that you can do is maybe provide them with a unique coupon code or some way to track them. Um, and then what you can do is you can take them out as their own cohort. And what I mean by that is you can go into your customer records, see who used that coupon, and then extract that list of people and then see what the churn rate was for them in all, and then take that out of your general churn rate for the rest of your subscribers. And then you can see if it was actually a problem with the box that month, if it was, if it was just a problem with that source from customer acquisition or something like that um, so so uh, that's these are the good churn rates when we want to shoot at I would like to say you know shoot for 10 12 13 percent or so um, if you get lower than that that's really great if you get a little bit higher than that it's not not a huge deal um, but keep these churn rates in mind um, when thinking about your business um, so how do we reduce churn and increase retention um, so one of the best ways to do this is just to set a good foundation. And as Jameson mentioned earlier, um, you know, one of the biggest problems could be is that maybe your product's just not a good fit for uh, your customers. Um, so a big part of that is setting those customer expectations. Um, so how are you spelling out your product offering? Are you spelling out a retail value? And what are like the value propositions that you're actually offering customers on your website or on social media or in different advertisements? Um, and then, you know, are you following through with that? You know, take a look at your past boxes and then did you meet those expectations? If you say you have an average $50 value and the last three months you've only had a $35 value, that could be a pretty obvious explanation of the high churn you've been seeing. Um, like Jameson said, maybe you just didn't spend enough time procuring the best products. Um, so if you if you think it might be something along these lines of expectations are off, or I, I've been seeing really high churn in the 20, 25% range, and I need to figure out what it is, one of the best things to do is just get that feedback. When a customer churns, send them a survey to complete. Um, and you can either do this um, as a part of an email, uh, email campaign, or you can just do this directly in customer service um, through Zendesk, which we'll show you how to do that later too. Um, but you know, you can use something like SurveyMonkey or Wufu um, to make a quick form, and you could just ask them a couple questions. You know, uh, what were your expectations? How were those expectations met? How do you think we can make the service better? Um, but but from the start, you've got to set those those good customer expectations because when a customer's expectations aligns with what you actually offer. They're going to be happy customers. Yeah, and if customers if customers feel misled, you know, right out the gate because they got something really kind of different than what they thought they would get, um, you know, that's that's one of the biggest reasons I see for customers canceling is they just it did they didn't it didn't meet expectations, and that's one of the that's one of the easiest things for you to affect right out of the gate too. Just make sure you know what's represented on your site is really in line with what you're sending your customers. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so I see, just, just to touch base really quick, I see a couple of questions being answered on the right-hand side. Um, just to remind you, if you did ask a question before, um, we no longer have it, so please re-ask your questions um, about any of the subject matter here. Um, so method two. So we've set a good foundation. Customers know what they're getting, um, and they're happy with what they're getting. Um, the next step of, of making sure it turns to be low is to make sure that you're servicing those customers very, very quickly. Um, and speed of response is critical. Um, there's a couple of different stats here. So Force Research found that 41% of consumers, almost half of people basically, expect to reply within six hours. Um, that's, a, that's very, very fast. Um, you know, some of the best uh, businesses will be replying within 30 minutes. I think the, the business that had the, the best um, reply rate was like Office Depot or something like that of the big business that they were looking at and they did it in somehow in like 34 minutes on average. Um, I don't think that you need to do that necessarily that quickly, um, but that's something to keep in mind. I mean, try to get same day customer responses out to them. Um, if you can get it to them in three or four hours, that's great. I mean, if, if you have a relatively small business, a couple hundred customers, chances are you're only dealing with maybe 20 or 30 tickets or emails a week. Um, so it should be something pretty manageable. You know, take take an hour out of each day, you know, in the middle and at the end of each day just to answer those, those um, requests. And to kind of kind of reinforce that on social media if someone posts on your facebook wall or posts a question to your instagram or something like that one out of three people expect a response in 30 minutes which is even crazier um as far as response speed um so the the the, the long and short of this is 
make sure you have a way to be monitoring these channels um, and uh, carve out time in your schedule to always make sure you're, you're, you're taking a moment to answer customer service requests. Um, so yeah, sounds nice, but you know, how do you actually do it? Um, so we've, we've aligned a couple different um, methods here for doing that, which are all available through something like Zendesk. Um, you want to kick off with macros? Yeah, um, so, I mean, basically, macros are the easiest way to, um, you know, sort of automate customer service. It's not quite automated, but they're basically templates. You know, with my business, I think we probably have 20 different templates um, that help us cover, like, you know, most of the different scenarios of tickets that we get. Um, so they're, you know, cancellation requests, they're refund requests, um, they're missing items, um, stuff like that. Um, and I actually, at this point, I actually have a, I pay a customer service contractor a dollar 25 a ticket to answer them all for me and sort of um you know taking off the last side um you know i i make sure that she does at least no later than one hour response times um and she has all the macros available to her and i trained her on you know how and when to use the macros um and then also not completely rely on the macros because it's also important to have make it seem like a personal response you know when they start to seem templatized and they, they feel like you know they're not personal and you haven't really read their request and that's when you start to have problems so you know use macros with with care but they can definitely make your job a lot easier yeah so some examples of that you know let's say hypothetically you have a customer who writes in and says hi i'd like to cancel before my november box ships um a, a macro would be um, a one-click thing that you can do within Zendesk to uh, apply a short written message that says, hi, you know, Jessica, um, thanks very much for emailing us. Um, here's this little pitch about the next box, or here's this little, you know, your account's been canceled. But it, it fills all that stuff in through, in your email automatically, so you don't actually have to type everything out. So if you find yourself typing a lot of emails to customers, macros are a great first step to stopping um wasting time doing that. The next way, uh, the next tool are called filters, um, also called views in Sendesk. Um, but basically what these filters and views are, um, they're used to organize emails based on specific attributes, like the words that are contained in those messages when they were received and what the status of the ticket or the email is. So for example, um, a good example of a view would be uh, cancellated cancellation request um, uh emails. And what it will do is you can define this filter in Zendesk that says, show me all the tickets that the words cancel or cancellation or refund show up in. Um, and then it will take all of those emails that are being emailed to your, you know, support at mybox.com. Um, it'll put them all in a specific folder. And then you can work through all of those emails uh, individually. So this could be based on whether it's cancellation requests, whether they were received in the last 24 hours, whether they were received in the last hour. Um, or whether they're pending or they have some special attribute about them, um, something that you have to go revisit or, or something like that. Um, uh, I probably use like about eight or nine different filters, mostly about, it's mostly time-based. One of them is for bloggers, uh, one of them is for cancellations, one of them is for refunds. Do you have any special cases of filters that you use or views that you use in Zendesk besides that? Um, I keep it pretty simple. I usually just have one for time to make sure that if a ticket's um, over 24 hours and hasn't gotten a response, um, it gets thrown into that view. So I, I make sure to prioritize though. But right. um, in general, we just try to respond them as fast as possible to get them out of there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the other two things are called automations and triggers. Um, these are, I, I use these less often because you only set them up once and then you're kind of done. And actually Zendesk has a lot of really good uh, automations and triggers already built in. Um, so we won't spend a lot of time talking about these. So one example of an automation uh, is that it will modify a ticket's properties at a specific time after the ticket is updated. So what that means is, let's say you reply to someone's email, you said, okay, great, we got your replacement box coming, let me know if I can help with anything else. You go and hit, you, you hit solved in Zendesk, and it, it applies that status of solved that ticket. Um, after four days, if that customer hasn't um, replied again to that ticket, it'll set it to closed. And then in, in order for that customer to email you again or to reply that to that ticket, it'll actually open up a new ticket um, that doesn't have that history. It, it, it assumes that it's basically a new issue. Um, so that's what an automation is. Triggers are similar. They take action when a ticket is created or updated. Um, the main trigger that I use that, you know, Craig Joel uses, and I'm sure uh, Jameson uses too, um, is it requires it notifies customers when a request has been received. So if you email me, uh, you get a request back that says, hey, thanks so much for emailing Prosperly. We'll answer your email within the next 24 hours. Um, if you need a 
quicker answer, please, you know, use this other channel or look up these self-help solutions basically. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that gets sent right away. So kind of coming back to response times, that's a really great way to set up a trigger like that to get answers to customers really quickly without actually having to go deeply into their issue. And they'll understand that it's computer generated. You know, I'll just say, Hey, we've received your response. Here are some different solutions that you can use right away. Um, uh, so we'll just dive a little bit more into these um, with kind of why these are important. So, you know, macros, single click replies. It, this can greatly increase your reply time speed. Um, filters, uh, they help you prioritize your work. They can greatly increase your reply time speed. Some example <laughs> views that we kind of chatted about earlier is high priority tickets, low priority tickets, cancer related tickets. Um, you know, you can be very creative with the different um, types of views you, you use. Triggers, notify customers of received requests, automations, help keep Zendesk clean, basically. Um, and those things improve customer experience and agent experience. If you want to learn more about these things, we have a uh, article on subscription school called Optimizing Email Support. This is a little link. So this will be in the, the PDF download um, when we put this up on subscription school. But you can also just go to subscriptionschool.com and uh, look at the, the article, Optimizing Email Support for Customer Service. Um, so if you have any questions about macros, filters, triggers, automations, um, now is the time to ask them in the right-hand uh, panel. Um, we're about to move on to something different, so we're going to kind of get away from Zendesk right now. Um, but like Jameson said, this is just very foundational stuff. Um, mm -hmm. This is stuff that you want to be doing um, just to make sure that you are satisfying customers and you know not wasting your time answering tickets. Um, so uh, this next one's about superior customer service. Um, and this is something that I know that Jameson and I both have learned a lot about um, doing this for so long. Previously, I mean, if customers were, were missing products in their boxes, um, for lots of the businesses that we ran, we tried you know, sending them maybe the replacement item, um, uh, you know, uh, and one of the things that we noticed is just sending a full replacement box um, and avoiding certain, you know, language in our tickets, um, certain kind of negative or words and obviously slang words like gonna or, you know, something like that. Um, adding that extra level of uh, customer service um, to, for your customers really enriches the experience. Um, so examples are, you know, avoid those words. If a product is broken, just send a full replacement box. If a box was accidentally sent after they, you know, canceled and you accidentally and you did refund them, don't ask for the box back. Allow them to keep it at no charge. Like, hey, it's a gift from us. Um, basically, the takeaway is that small adjustments can make customers, um, uh, you know, return, return to a, a loyal status um, and even talk about their experiences in online communities. Um, Yep. Yeah. I mean, write, write thorough responses. I mean, like make them feel personal. And, and like Jesse said, don't be afraid to just offer a refund or send them a full box replacement. It's, it's totally worth it. You know, there's no, I mean, those kind of experiences allow you to turn them into, you know, basically things that make it seem like you guys have really good customer service. A lot of these seem, things seem obvious, but the, the reason we're talking about this is because we see so many people that you know, like write, you know, three word responses or they use, you know, unprofessional language like this. And we, we just can't stress how important it is to, to take your time here and, and, and make these responses feel personal and professional. Yeah. For, for one, for one business to kind of just illustrate that a little bit that we were, that we were helping with, um, you know, this, 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 this guy had been writing literally one word responses and he was just writing the word, okay. And it'd just be the letters O and K, not like he didn't even spell out the word okay completely. Um, and like that was like an example. And he, he was actually under the impression that he was doing a pretty good job because he was doing quick reply times, which is like, no, you've got to take the time to address their concerns. You know, if, if they're saying that they have a problem with your subscription or there's some specific item in the box this month they didn't enjoy, acknowledge that. Say, hey, Karen or whatever her name is, um, I'm so sorry I didn't like that item. Um, next month we've got this other cool item. I'd love to send you a little gift from us at the office or something like that because you couldn't use this big high value item in the box or you know whatever the situation is. Acknowledge the request, provide a solution for them, and then ask if you can help with anything else. Um, and that's a really great way to take a customer who's upset and turn them into a, an evangelist for your brand, really. Um, um, so outside of providing that great customer service, um, there's all, there's another thing that you can do even if they've canceled, and that's remarketing to them. Um, you can still get those customers back. Um, and one of the ways we do this is by creating a list in MailChimp um, or whatever email provider you're using and um, you know, sorting those customers out um, in your Create Your Dashboard and then importing them into your, your MailChimp and then sending them different emails. Um, yeah, I mean, basically keep track of your canceled customers, keep them in a separate list, and, and, you, guys, and you can send uh, email marketing and, and updates to them. So... 
you know, uh, we'll talk about this later, but, you know, sending them a, a sneak peek or a teaser of one of the items and a, and a future box coming up or, you know, sending them some updates or maybe a, maybe a, a promotion to get them to come back and um, try the service again. Or, you know, maybe you send an email where you acknowledge that you've, you know, recently list, listened to a bunch of feedback and made some changes. Like there's plenty of good excuses um, and reasons to, to ask someone to try your service again. Um, and usually these canceled customers can be low hanging fruit because they've already experienced your product and your, your brand. And um, it's, it's likely going to be easier to bring them back on than to, uh, you know, find a new customer from a new channel. Yeah. I have to say too, to kind of echo that. Um, I, I find that my canceled list um, in MailChimp uh, has some of the highest open rates and some of the highest click through rates for, um, for my emails. Um, and so what that tells me is that, yes, my canceled subscribers are still interested in the service. Like whether they necessarily subscribe that month or they, um, you know, are just kind of looking at the content, like I can tell that they're still interested. Um, and that gives me kind of, you know, a little, little bit of a confidence booster. And also I, I'm pretty sure I get a, a good, you know, half dozen or, or 10 or so subscribers from my cancel list each month. Um, at this point, and my thing, my list is only around 150 or 200 people. You know, it's about maybe you know less than half of my normal leads list um, for for Prosperly, but um, I still it still gets pretty good returns. Um, so I will I'll show you how to do this, how to in, in your Create dashboard how to filter to canceled. Um, uh, we can uh, we can actually jump into that. I just want to uh, let's skip to the next slide first. Actually, it looks like we got a couple more notes here. Um, so besides sending these people one-off emails, um, which would be like a single promotion where you just send an email to that list really quick, um, you can also put its own into its own remarketing funnel. Um, and what that deals with is automation workflows in MailChimp. Um, and what this means is, so um, you'll take that same, um, that you'll do the same process. You know, you'll, you'll filter for cancel, you'll export that current filter, you'll create that list in MailChimp. Um, and then in MailChimp, you'll go under the automation section and you can create a new workflow and then um, when you open that workflow, you can assign a list to that workflow and you'll choose your canceled list. And so if you want to, you can create like a, you know, four or five, six part email series that gets sent out over a 90 day period that incentivizes them to come back or, you know, does different things at different points to maybe gather data or to provide special discounts or, um, just some other things about your business to try to get those customers back. Um, so let's see, I just want to, uh, I want to uh, show you really quickly how to do this. So if you go to my.creatro.com and you're logging into your, your merchant portal here, uh, if you go to uh, subscriptions, um, so it's right here on the left-hand side, you go to subscriptions, you can see here subscription status, and you can go to that, you can see the canceled status. Um, so we're under subscriptions, subscription status, canceled, um, and then what you can do is uh, export that current filter. So you export that current filter. It gives you a CSV of all these people's email addresses and their names. Um, and then when you go into your MailChimp, um, you know, you go and you create a new list. Let's just go ahead and use the subscription school. I'll just use Crossfully, I guess. Um, you can go here to lists. You can create a, you can create a list here. Um, actually, I've already got one created for canceled. Um, and then you, you know, you just add subscribers, you import subscribers, um, which you can just copy and paste from that Excel you got from, uh, create joy. So it's super simple to create a canceled subscriber list. And then, like I said, in the automation section, you can create a workflow that, um, sends, uh, your subscribers a series of emails afterwards. Um, so I know that was pretty quick. So if, if you, if you do have, uh, Questions about that? We will um, we'll uh, we'll touch base back with that too. So that was a pretty quick little presentation there. So let me get this back up here. Um, so method five: using teasers and spoilers. And because this has a beautiful Yogi surprise example, I will let Jameson explain it. Yeah. So this has become increasingly one of my favorite methods. You know, uh, you know, obviously we've got our customer service nailed and a lot of those foundational basics in place, but. Um, in terms of like really converting my list of leads and bring, bringing canceled customers back, this is one of the most helpful things. Um, I'm sure you've heard of, you know, teasers or spoilers or sneak peeks. And I, I'm guessing a lot of you guys do some of this to an extent. Um, you know, 
P people, you know, buy Yogi Surprise or many subscriptions because of the surprise element, which is great. But you know, showing them one of the items coming up or an example of what they're get, what they're going to get um, really goes a long way. So the first thing I do every month is I pick a new teaser product, um, and I usually will pick one of the higher value products, um, you know, or one of the more intriguing, unique products coming up. So I, it's it's kind of a you know it's kind of a gut instinct sort of thing. You want you kind of choose the product that you think people are going to be most excited about. Um, I use teasers in a lot of different ways. Um, so one of the first things I do, um, you'll see this little image on the right. This is actually a a little square card that I print out. And we put this in the box each month because we want our customers to see, you know, a little peek of what's coming up. And, uh, you know, we hope that that actually helps prevent people from from canceling. Um, and we tested it. We kind of A-B tested it uh, month after month. Sometimes we do it, sometimes we don't. Um, and it, it seems to actually reduce the number of cancellation requests that we get. Um, the other thing that we do is um, we we use them in our, in our email marketing. So, um, you know, we have a big list of leads that we get through our opt-in pop-ups um, and uh, we send them these emails with the teasers and we show them the value. We give them a little description of the, the item and then we, um, we, also, uh, we also give them an idea of what the other products in the box are. Um, and so this usually helps push some of our leads over, over the line and get them signed up. Um, and then the, on top of that, the other way we use them is in our macros. Um, so when a, a cancellation request comes in, one of the first things we do is um, get them a little example of what's coming up in the next month. Um, we show them the teaser product, and then we actually link to a landing page where we feature the teaser product. Um, so if we go to the next slide here, um, you'll see on the left is uh, the teaser landing page. So I have two products, the jewelry box and the lifestyle box. Um, this is a landing page that we only use in our customer service macros. So when a cancellation request comes in, we tell them about the teaser product, um, and uh, we usually give a little description of what the other products are going to be be like if there's sort of a theme. Um, and then we link to this landing page where it shows pictures of them and it shows them the value and gives them more information. Um, that's the only that's this landing page is dedicated for that. And then on the right, you'll see um, an example of the type how we use teasers in our email marketing. Um, so we, we have a little picture of the box there. Um, the, the, we actually released uh, two teasers for the lifestyle box there on the left. Um, and then we show them what the you know estimated retail value of the box is going to be as well. So um, these three ways that we use teasers have been really, really effective. So I, um, frankly, I, I've only used teasers in email marketing and on social media, but having this teaser landing page is, is a really good idea. And actually um, creating landing pages in CrateJoy isn't super difficult. Um, you know, you'll, I'm sure some of you are kind of wondering about that, like, oh, a teaser landing page. I don't see that in my editor. Um, it's, it's not currently an option right now in CrateJoy. Um, you'd have to go to the design section and then go ahead and hit code and then create a new page. Um, so if you do want to create a teaser landing page, um, you know, you'll probably need to, you know, get the help of a local developer. Um, you know, it might cost, you know, a couple hours, maybe, you know, run 90, a hundred bucks or something like that. Um, but it, it is it is still very super valuable, um, and you know the success that you can see with it, like like Jameson mentioned, by including that link in your your customer service macros, um, uh, it's a really great way to get those those customers. I, I noticed that in my teaser marketing on, on in emails or on social media, um, that always drives a couple purchases. Um, so definitely consider doing this. You know, look at your higher price items maybe, um, or some really cool intriguing items, um, and kind of use those um, in in some different forms of marketing. Um, whether it's on social media or through emails or something like that. Yeah, and you you also get better at like you know choosing the right product, the one that's really going to drive the most results for you. Um, you know, a good place to start though, like like we said, is you know choose one of the higher value items and choose one of the more intriguing items. Okay, so I'm just quickly typing out a couple answers here. Um, so it looks like we got uh, some good questions coming in. I've, I've answered this couple, question a few times, but yeah, uh, this this whole slideshow will be available on subscriptionschool.com. Um, so uh, you will be able to access the slideshow and all the resources. So um, we get, just gave you a bunch of different crazy cool things to reduce your churn. So what are you waiting for? Just do it. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, to answer one of the questions that we saw up here, I saw it up here at the top. Um, you know, do you suggest creating a Zendesk account from day one, even if you don't have many or any subscribers? Um, 
I, I suggest starting a, a Zendesk account from day one. I mean, you can get a 30-day free trial, and then you can even call up Zendesk and be like, hey, I'm getting ready to launch a business. Can I get another free 30 days? And so you can get a free 60 days of Zendesk um, while you're doing your pre-launch. And absolutely, you know, create your Zendesk now. Uh, start making macros. Start making filters. Start making automations and triggers. Um, start gathering data on your Zendesk. One of the things that we didn't touch on uh, was tags on Zendesk and, and the reporting dashboard because that's a whole different discussion. But um, the earlier you start gathering data and the earlier you start servicing customers, the more powerful your Zendesk is going to be. Um, so I suggest starting this, like if you're thinking about starting the business, as soon as you put up your landing page to gather leads, have a Zendesk account ready because you'll probably have people email you asking questions. Um, uh, so yeah, just to reinforce that, just do that. Get, get these things, um, you know, prepared and as, as one of these as one of the kind of a, a little extra assignment for you here is for next Tuesday um, you know we, we talked a lot about remarketing doing sneak peeks to cancel subscribers um, so on it says November 4th um, so six days from now Tuesday because um, Tuesday is one of the best days to email you should have created created a Zendesk account if you haven't already um, or you can use desk or some other service but as long as you create some type of customer service portal create that um, create some views um, your, you know, your 24 hour view, your less than 24 hour view, create a couple macros, um, get your triggers and automation set up and create a canceled list in your MailChimp or whatever mail service uh, provider you use. Um, so go back to your Create Choice site, export your subscriptions under the filter of canceled and then upload that list um, to your MailChimp so you have this database of customers that you can email to. And then send out a come back and save money email or whatever it's called. Um, send a sneak peek to them. Um, make a point for Tuesday morning to have an email sent out to your canceled list and to have a Zendesk account to answer requests in case you that email generates any emails to you. Um, so take a look at this assignment, um, make a note on your calendar right now, um, and be sure that you knock this out of the park um, in a couple days here. So I'm gonna switch up to the next slide. Um, now we'll do the Q&A session. Um, and while we're doing the Q&A session, I'm gonna leave up this action item reminders. Um, which is kind of sets up, uh, you know, these, these six or so things that we suggest doing as far as creating a Zendesk account, creating your shortcuts, doing a WooFoo if you want to gather feedback, creating standards for replacements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let's look at some of these questions here. Um, so the first one is, uh, how can I get some one-on-one -on -one help? Um, the best thing to do is email support at createjoy.com. Uh, we've got an amazing team of uh, support, uh, people who can help you, their engineers, their product managers, um, their account managers, everybody at Creature works on customer support. So um, shoot us an email and we'll see what we can do. Um, you can also probably get, a, get on the phone with one of our account managers, um, you know, Sydney uh, or Josh, um, if you have some other specific questions about Creature. Um, oh, how do you get, how do you um, stop your customers from canceling right after they subscribe? I guess one of the things we didn't mention is, um, is uh, some of the built-in features on CreateJoy, the ability for customers to cancel mm. on their own yep. as well as skip a month. Um, our recommendation, Jesse, is that is that feature there? That feature is that feature customers is there. Cancel themselves. Yeah, customers can cancel themselves. So I'm gonna be totally honest with you. Um, I've actually removed that feature from my business because I want to push everybody through my Zendesk. Yeah, it's not but, that we want to make it hard for yeah. them to cancel either, though, right? Like, yeah, it's not that I want. It's not that we want to make it hard. I mean, I, I make sure that I get you know four or five hour response times for my business, so people never really have to wait. Um, so if you if you keep that feature, which is actually a really useful feature for a lot of people, um, and I actually haven't really done the math to see if my churn would have been higher or lower if I would have kept that, um, I think it is a really cool feature and a lot of people like to use I, it. Yeah, I um, prefer skip skip a month though. I yeah. mean, look, I think it's really important that you get a chance to talk to the customer before they cancel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my cancellation process, same with Jesse's, is is always a two step process. They they email in, they want to cancel. And you say, "Oh, I'm sorry to hear. I'd be happy to help you with that." You know, by the way, I would before you cancel though, I do want to make sure that you you know see this this teaser for next month. Um, you you want to at least try to briefly sell them on sticking around, and if they say no, then cancel them right away. But yeah. I just I just don't like the idea of letting people just cancel immediately because a lot of times there's a simple question that you could answer for them that would prevent them from canceling, or maybe they're confused about something. Like mm -hmm. if you get a chance to address those things, I mean literally you can you know cut the amount of people that cancel in half yeah. just by just by. Yeah you know, getting a chance to address some of their concerns. Yeah, I've been I've been seeing about 20 to 30 cancellations for my business, which has about 200 subscribers, so about 10 to 15% right in that range. Um, and I usually get about 40 cancellation requests. 
I usually save at least one one third of the people who, who email in. Um, so to answer your question, how do you how do you prevent them from canceling after they just subscribe? Um, you know, maybe gate it, you know, maybe remove your, uh, can your self cancel option. Skip a month is different. Like Jameson saying, skip a month just pushes the billing back 30 days. So they're still not canceled. They're still going to be rebuilt. Um, so it's a little bit different. Yeah, And I love that feature. Um, you know, with my business, I probably see three to 400 cancellation requests every month. And, uh, I, 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 I think about half of them are people who want to cancel not because they have a problem with the service. It's just simply a budget. It's a, it's a personal mm -hmm. financial right. issue and the ability to just, you know, skip, you know, skip a month, um, uh, I think can really save a bunch of people from turning out. Yeah, definitely. So the next question here is, do you find that higher price boxes around 50 bucks have higher churn rates than lower price boxes? Um, not necessarily. I think if anything, the, the conversion rates are going to be a little bit lower on your website. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if someone, Usually if someone's, what I've seen, if anything, is that higher price right, boxes have, um, yeah. Yeah, have lower yeah. churn because the customers are more likely to be able to actually afford that service. It's, it's high enough to where your, your, probably, your customer base is probably a more affluent audience. Um, it's, I think with a higher price subscription, the downside is, it, um, is uh, onboarding those customers in the first place is a little bit harder. But yeah. it, I don't think it affects churn yeah. negatively. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I would agree with that. I don't think it would make it really measurable. If anything, it might help it because they value the subscription more as long as you're fulfilling your expectations, you know, right. obviously. With a $50 yeah. box, you better yeah. be making if, it a nice if box. You're spend, if people are spending 50 bucks, it better be a super nice box with like a high retail value um, or something really compelling about it. So next question, does churn include month-to-month -month customers or is it only calculated with subscription customers? Month-to-month, um, -month, if, if you mean... Those would still be subscription customers. If you mean gifts or like one-time purchases, no, because those people never cancel. Um, so you just consider those orders. Um, I don't calculate my gifts or one-off orders in my churn rate at all. Um, my churn rate is exclusively for the people who sign up monthly. I actually only offer a month-to-month -month subscription. Um, so uh, uh, I, I'm, I think we're answering your question there. But basically, yeah, don't include gifts in one-time orders. Um, do you think having a custom box helps helps with churn? Well, it certainly helps with customer experience, um, and customer experience, as we know, is in, you know inherently tied to churn. I don't think it's going to make or break it. If yeah, you have I mean, I think, offering, I think but, better personal, more personalization definitely is going to help churn. But I'm not a fan of of like high amounts of personalization because it makes it the business more logistically challenging. I always recommend just get just finding a more a micro niche, you know, an, an audience where like, you know, you can do one size fits all. Um, and they're all, it's all feels really personal to them. Mm -hmm. I don't know, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, actually on a, a real quick comment on one benefit of having a custom box, um, which I just want to real quickly, uh, jump back to the slide that Jameson has here for these teasers. Um, uh, one cool thing about having a custom box is you might be able to have a call to action inside your box to maybe look at something on your website or like in your for a referral program um, or something that can help you grow or something that will help customers get free boxes. So by doing a custom box, um, you know, you can draw attention to specific things which may help curb churn or help inspire more growth. Um, but I think inherently as far as product offering wise, just a nice piece of packaging necessarily isn't going to you know, totally curb your churn. I've seen subscription boxes with just very, very basic packaging that are doing extremely well. Um, so is Zendesk free or discounted for Creature Merchants? A discount for Creature Merchants would be totally awesome, but it's not free. Um, it's something like 20 bucks a month, so it's it's very economical. Um, the amount of time you'll save uh, is worth it. If you if you get you know consider your time worth 20 bucks an hour or so, um, you will definitely save more than one hour a month. I can guarantee you that. So it's 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 worth it. Um, so do you announce the contents or a sneak peek of boxes before the cutoff for cancellation? We received some feedback asking us to do this, but we're not sure if churn will increase or decrease because of this. For example, if you email subscribers on the 15th announcing the theme and some of the contents, customers then have five days to cancel or skip. Um, so that's a great question. You could email your sneak peek um, or and your theme to, to your non-active list, to your leads list, and to your canceled list. Maybe don't send that information to your current subscribers because they're already subscribed and you don't want to remind them maybe about the subscription or you don't want to, you know, inspire them to cancel. So, yes, um, uh, send it out before your cutoff date, but just don't send it to your active subscribers. You know, send it to your leads list or your cancels list. Um, I don't think you have to do a sneak peek for current subscribers. It's not like they can subscribe again um, mm -hmm. unless they really want to. Um, yeah, I actually I don't send teasers to my current subscribers. Yeah, no, neither do I. Neither do I. Um, so we covered the cost of Zendesk thing. I got someone, we got someone asking a question, um, wanted to clarify whether 
I, with my business, let customers cancel on their own? Um, the answer is no, I don't. I like to I like to have people email in to can to have a, to submit a cancellation request. I like to have the opportunity to quickly try and sell them on the next month. If they say no, then I cancel them right away. But um, I'm usually not for letting people just simply cancel on their own. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, so when should you consider hiring an individual for the customer service portion? Um, it really depends on your customer service workload. I mean, like I said, if, if you have a subscription with a couple hundred customers, you're probably going to see you know a dozen or two dozen tickets or emails each week. Um, for me, you know, it's really easy to manage. I actually have someone help me manage that too, um, and so I spend very very little time on it. I, I probably would wait until you know. This, it, it depends on your schedule. Yeah, honestly. with a good Zendesk setup, um, it's fairly manageable on your own. I mean, I would say up to maybe three or four hundred um, tickets a month. Um, you know, my I pay my customer service contractor about uh, eleven hundred bucks a month, and uh, she answers about seven hundred tickets. Um, so you know, it's 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 still pretty affordable there. But I think if you've got a good Zendesk setup, it becomes it's pretty manageable on your own. If you're trying to manage your customer service all from an inbox or something, it gets a little more challenging to do it by yourself. So. Yeah, yep, it becomes very challenging. Uh, in our in our first subscription business together, Conscious Box, we uh, this was before all these tools that even really come out. And initially, we were using an uh, you know an Outlook inbox and organizing by folders, and then trying to power through stuff and copy and pasting things. Um, that took a lot of time. With Zendesk, you're just not going to spend a lot of time um, on the few dozen emails you might get with a couple hundred customers. So, how can we set up something that automatically email customers 30 days before a credit card expires? I think that's something already built into Gratefully. The credit card credit card expiring yeah. emails. I'm not sure. Um, it would be under your notifications panel in the Gratefully. Um, I think there's one already set up there. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure, um, how you could, how you could set that up with in Cratechoy. You might use your, 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 your payment processor might be able to give you a list of people or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Either way, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not there. It's something that's in Cratechoy. Yeah. I think it's in Cratechoy. Um, so what's the portal for listening to past webinars? That's subscriptionschool.com. Can Zenesk be tied back to Cratechoy or just a standalone website? It's standalone. It's, it's connected to your email like your support at mybox.com. Um, yeah, and then you, you would install the, the Zendesk widget on your Cratio store. Right, yeah. So if you go to like prosperly.com or, you know, yogisurprise.com, one of our businesses, you'll see a little help thing in the right-hand corner, which is just a little piece of code you copy and paste in the, you know, index HTML. Um, it's super simple to do, and if you have, are confused about it, just email us at support at .com and we can either drop it in there for you or show you how to do it. Um, so when sending full box replacements, how do you control against person taking advantage and become repeat contacts? We currently send out replacement parts uh, for each. So I see you just send out single items. Honestly, you know, it's it's a reasonably it's a reasonable thing. You know, it, if you have a customer that emails you every single month, it's like, oh, my box is destroyed again, and you're like, oh, I guess I got to send you a full replacement. If you notice that type of behavior. I've rarely seen that, um, and I've probably emailed in the upwards of you know thirty thousand yeah. customers over my life. I mean, it, well, that's one of the benefits of Zendesk is it will show you you can, it'll show you the last um, several emails from that person. So if you see that that person's abusing um, your subscription and constantly doing things like that, I mean, you know, sometimes I'll fire customers in circumstances. Um, yeah, or instead offer them a partial refund, or offer them a different solution, or ask for a different mailing address because something seems to be going wrong. Or, um, yeah, like Jameson said, I mean, just tell them like, hey, you know, it, it seems like we're having a deliverability issue. <laughs> um, but I've, I've really seen that, Ian, to, to answer your question. Um, how do you issue a refund if a customer would like to cancel because they weren't aware their subscription auto renewed? Um, so uh, even if they emailed after the renewal date and their box wasn't shipped yet, I will still issue that person a refund. That goes back to superior customer service. I just issued, you know, a couple of refunds today, um, and I brought my subscriber count down be below 200, and I got really sad. <laughs> but that's just a part of doing good customer service. I mean, if someone renews and you don't mail for another two weeks, just give them the refund, um, and maybe give them a code, you know, an extra 10% off their next box to help them with their budget or something. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's I don't think it's wise to say, oh, you renewed, you're stuck in the subscription. Um, so, uh, so we got a question here about what's the first content wise, what's the first good email to send customers who have canceled? I don't really have a cookie cutter first email necessarily. Um, you know, they get their con cancellation confirmation from my support agent. Um, but then they just get put in the canceled list and they just become kind of part of the regular emails for me. 
Um, yeah, for me, they'll maybe get one sneak peek email a month. Um, and then may maybe every two or three months, I'll do like an e a special like rejoin email where I'll just be like, yeah, you know, yeah. this today only we're offering 30% off um, for canceled customers if you rejoin. So to answer your question, you know, just kind of treat them like regular, like your regular leads list. You know, um, you don't have to really craft the content very specifically. Just, you know, give them a sneak peek, give them a theme sneak peek. And, or, or other things like that. So does churn include month-to-month -month customers or it only calculate with subscription customers? So like that's a repeat question. Um, like we said, churn is only deals with subscription customers. It's for gifts and one-off orders, um, those people never cancel. So it's, it's difficult to, cut, to, to figure that out. How difficult is it to add a new page? Um, it's not incredibly difficult. Um, both James and I are, are not engineers. At Cratejoy, so I would suggest you know running into support at Cratejoy.com and ask them a little bit about it. There's probably a help desk se section too. Cratejoy's got a great um, Zendesk portal that they use that has a bunch of answers. But basically, you just go to the design page, hit code, and then add a new page. Um, you've got to pay some stuff in that page so it looks right, um, which is why I mentioned maybe hiring a local developer. Um, but you know maybe spend a couple hours on Craigslist to find someone who's a good programmer um, and spend 50 bucks on it. It's it's not too difficult. Um, um, what weighs more, a gallon of milk or a gallon of 83 octane gasoline? Well, they're both a gallon. <laughs> I'm not really sure. That's a great question, Daniel. Um, Mr. Druno. <laughs> Excellent. Um, how would you recommend hiring a contractor to initially set up your email marketing templates? Um, if you know someone that's great, I, I found a couple of great people over Craigslist. Um, and just kind of mentioning like, hey, we're looking for this. Um, I'm looking for this thing. I want to have you go into my MailChimp and make a nice custom uh, email for me or a nice custom landing page for me. Um, you can use other stuff like Yeah, Freelancer. I mean, though with MailChimp's templates, I mean, it's pretty easy to make something nice on your own as well. Yeah, but, um, but I totally understand. I, I, I personally like to get mine designed a little bit more. So I would just say, you know, um, Actually, a really great example of this, if you want to look at it, go to subscriptionschool.com and look at our most recent guide. It's about prosperly in the first six months of the business. And about halfway through that guide, um, there is a section where I talk about how I found my developer that I used to, to make the site custom. Um, and it has even like an email prompt that I used to reach out to them. Um, so you can kind of use that language. You don't need to be a programmer to reach out to a programmer, and they understand that. So um, just find someone, hop on the phone with them, and um, and uh, give them a couple tasks. Okay, so we've got about 10 questions left, so I think we can make it through all these. Would you advise to remove the option for customers to be able to automatically cancel your website? Um, yes, we kind of covered that already, but both James and I do not allow customers to cancel. Um, he allows them to skip, but I make them basically email me to do anything. Um, how do you stop them from canceling right after subscribe? We already covered that one. Um, is there a way to delete the canceled subscribers from your general MailChimp list? Yeah, you should... Um, in order to do this, let's let's hop out here and we can take a look. Um, since I'm already in Mailchimp, with your lists, um, you know, find your regular lead list. You know, let's find here my mine's pop-up subscribers. Um, you can go to Manage Subscribers in Mailchimp and you just unsubscribe those addresses. So, um, uh, you know, actually, I guess in this case, we'd actually be looking at current subscribers. So we go to our current subscriber list um, and then we unsubscribe addresses. And you would just, um, you know, paste their emails in here and then unsubscribe them so you don't hit those people with your regular emails or your, you know, whatever whatever different lists you have, um, you manage subscribers the same way. Just go to unsubscribe addresses and then take those people out based on the filters that you've sorted. Um, cool, so it looks like someone sent us a sneak peek and then it helped a lot. So it's good, it's good to see that that's working for you. Um, so how do you create macros? We don't wanna go into this a ton, um, but I'll just show you really quickly the Zendesk portal and kind of how it works. I'm going to spend like about 35 seconds on this. So if you really want to get a good explanation of this, go to subscriptionschool.com because that's where we'll, um, that's where there's some cool guides. This is my Zendesk portal. Um, you can see the tickets coming in. These are mostly bloggers or something about um, products. Uh, on the bottom left-hand side under admin, um, it shows you where you can create a bunch of different things. Um, so you've got macros, your views. Um, uh, you know, the different channels that you can link in, and then your business rules, which are those triggers and automations. So for example, macros, you just go ahead and click macros, um, and then you can add a macro. Um, and the way that you create these in Zendesk, super simple, you name it, uh, you click an option, like I wanna set the description to this, and you can say, hi, hi there, we received your request, and your 
subscription is canceled. Um, another cool thing that you can do is include these placeholders. So you can say, instead of saying hi there, you can say something like, uh, you know, ticket requester's first name. You can copy that. You can put it right here at the top. And then we'll say hi and then whatever your name is. So hi, Jesse. We received your email. Um, oh, looks like I forgot a word there. Not that I'm really creating this macro. But that's basically how you do it. Also, Zendesk, given that they're a customer service company, um, they have a really a lot of really great help guides. So check out Zendesk.com. Check out their help center. They have videos that walk you through these things. It's, it's very simple. Um, so, uh, so how do you go up setting up geo-specific billing? Right now, I can only build a U.S. dollar. Starting to set up a new creator store, so I have a Canadian customer and they're built in Canada. Um, that's honestly, I'm not totally sure about that. You would set that up under your, um, I believe, under checkout and under uh, um, where is that? Um, you can set different currencies. I know you can set different currencies. Um, frankly, I'm not the best person to ask for that. I would definitely email create your customer support, go email them at support at create <clears throat> uh, So this is off topic, but how do I stop accepting orders on create joy? So you can set your store into a uh, sold out mode and you can stop accepting orders there. Um, I'm not really sure where that is either. I've never had to do that. Um, you know, go into your account. I think it's just under account or something. Um, and you can just turn it to, let's see here. Um, yeah, I would, that's another good question for um, for Creator support. Um, you can just turn to, to sold out mode, or you can just close the store. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you're asking there exactly, though. Um, how do you remove the cancellation process? Um, so it looks like we've got uh, the self cancellation. We got a couple of questions about that. Um, uh, I actually had my programmer go in there and remove this the bit of code from. The account page so the way that you would actually do it is you'd go to design um, you would go into your stores code so here's the code section um, under the account page um, so we have here our HTML pages um, we can go under here under account um, and you can there's some little strip of code in here that includes the uh, the self cancellation process um, and I just removed that um, so that's probably, I don't want you to go around and poke in your code. I, like I said, I'm, I'm not a developer. I'm, I'm not a programmer. I probably shouldn't be giving you this, this advice. Um, so maybe email Create Choice customer support and ask them about that. Um, like I said, maybe keep the skip a month option. Um, but if you want to get your subscribers like Jameson and I do, um, just email email in and I'm sure, you know, POF or someone will help you. <laughs> um, so uh, let me just remove these questions. So that kind of answered all of those. Uh, so we got another question here that's a little bit off topic, but kind of on point with churn. Do you think $39 a month plus shipping is more appealing than $48.99 with free shipping? I think free shipping has always been more appealing based on the A-B tests that I've seen on the businesses that I've worked with. Um, and, and both James and I use that paradigm because free shipping seems to work better. Um, $48.99 looks weird, so I might just round it up to $49.99 or $49.95. Um, so... Um, so it looks like somebody here is, is thinking about dropping their price from about 40 bucks to about 20 bucks, and they want to know if dropping their price will significantly help churn and improving growth. Uh, potentially, I honestly don't know. You should definitely split test it. But the thing you've got to realize is when you make a big price adjustment in your for your business, number one, you got to think about what current customers are going to think and if they're going to be able to find that. Um, number two, you got to think about your margins. Are you able to really fulfill the box, pay for shipping, and pay for yourself with that $20? Uh, less of a price if so then um, you know uh, that's great but maybe instead of lowering your price you should spend more of your margin on better product and that might help with return and growth so that really depends on the product um, but I would definitely split test it now it's been a lot of time thinking about it because it's kind of dangerous um, so is it a trap to offer a free box or lower the price on a cancellation in contrast how many will restart the subscription so I usually offer like an extra 10% off their next month um, and so I already have a 10% off lifetime discount that I've already built into my pricing model. So people, you know, they hit the site and they see it's 50 bucks, but you can get 10% off. Um, and so when someone cancels, I'm like, hey, let's make it 20% off just the next month. Um, I don't ever offer a free box because my box is, is a higher price box. Um, but, 
you know, that's an interesting idea. Maybe you can try it. One of the cool things about Zendesk is when you when you save a ticket, um, for example, uh, you can add tags. Um, so you see this tag section right here, tag tag. So if you if you want to try this in your Zendesk, maybe put here like free box offer when you offer someone a free box, and then if it works, then hit save. And if it doesn't work, then just leave it as free box. And then you can, in the, the data and analytics section of, of Zendesk, you can look at which uh, tickets have those tags associated with it. So that's just that's just one example of how you could split test it. Um, I don't think it's a trap, though. I think a free box is pretty expensive. Um, so let me just get through here. Jameson had to take a call. Um, cancellation, disable feature. Um, so we have another question here. Um, a little bit question about marketing, um, which uh, we're, we're a little bit over already, so I can't answer all these questions about marketing. Um, you know, as far as driving traffic, we just released a really cool holiday gift guide. If you go to uh, start.cratejoy.com, um, uh, this is kind of our main landing page here. You go ahead and hit blog. Um, this one is uh, this this guide right here, our holiday season marketing guide. For you, Jake, if you're looking about paid traffic, there's a great section in there. If you're looking about PR and getting stuff written about you, there's a great section in that PDF. Um, uh, uh, and so that's this this holiday mar season marketing guide is, is a great guide for everybody in this webinar right now. I definitely suggest going to read it. Uh, the cool thing is, is you can download it as a PDF or as an EPUB, so you can get a little ebook that you can read on your Kindle or something like that. Um, so what do you guys do to retrieve potential customers who drop up on checkout pages? Uh, there's a really great app for this in the App Store. It's called Card Hook. Um, so Card Hook automatically turns abandoned cart customers into paying customers. Oh, it looks like I haven't even installed it. I'm gonna go ahead and install that right now. So um, Card Hook um, is a, a a system that's going to look at who dropped off those pages, um, and then will allow you to either you know um, you know remarket to them or get their information or you know somehow appeal to them to come back to check out. Um, so I'd definitely suggest going up here and setting this up. I haven't set it up yet, so I don't know Cartook's specific way of doing it. Um, but definitely um, check this out. Also, exit intent pops up. So when someone you know is going up to the top left to hit the X sign, you can have a little pop up up here right there. You can do that through like Optin Monster or even Sumo Me, which is another uh, app that Creator offers. So there's a couple different ways. Um, so if Facebook doesn't allow ads in your niche, how else can you boost posts? Um, one idea, um, this might be maybe tobacco related or something, um, one idea instead of posting about your product specifically, have a blog post about something related to your product and then promote that blog post. Generally blog posts and written content that's interesting performs better than ads anyways. Um, so maybe try that. That, that, that might work for you. Um, so another question, how do you turn off the self-cancellation? Again, write in the support at courageo.com and they can help you out. I think it's just a line of code you take out. Um, looks like we got that question several times in a row here. Um, okay, so we got four questions left. Um, so we're only 10 minutes over, so we'll, we'll go ahead and take them. Um, so is there a way... Uh, to ask someone from Creator to confirm all configurations are set up correctly before launching. I'm sure you can shoot in and someone can take a peek at your store um, for you. Or, you know, shoot, a, shoot over a, an email to, um, you know, so support at Creator.com and they can they can check it out. Um, it's, it's pretty simple, though. So if you haven't set it up yet, chances are you've already got it set up correctly. Um, what would a typical email marketing flow look like for new leads that entered their email in a launch page? Uh, that's a great question, Marcus. Um, so for me, for my launch page, I did weekly kind of update emails. So, hey, you know, we're five weeks away from launch. Here's um, some cool ideas that we're working on. Um, and the next one, I did a sneak peek of different types of items that might turn out in the box. You know, the week after that, I did one about don't forget to refer your friends. Um, so uh, those are all good kind of flows to put people through. Um, you know, it depends on your product, obviously. To get a good idea, though, of uh, good email marketing tips, honestly, that holiday marketing season guide uh, is another good one. Also, subscriptionschool.com, we, we talked about pre-launches here quite a bit. Um, so this is a good asset for you. Just go ahead and, and check out these email marketings, everything under uh, customer acquisition and marketing. You'll find some good ideas for emails. Here's a here's a pre-launch one. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. Uh, Okay, let's take a look at this next one here. So it uh, looks like here someone wants to, uh, uh, to do a um, webinar on procurement. We'll definitely be doing one of those shortly. Um, 
So I read how you shop for new products at Whole Foods as well as local merchants. Do you prefer including items from Whole Foods or local merchants more than a surprise aspect of your customers? And how do you find more unknown local merchants with great products? Um, this must be referring to Jameson since Jameson's always in Whole Foods. Um, but uh, personally, I prefer more local merchants. Prosperly is a is a more of an artisanal kind of angled business. I like to focus on small local artisans. Um, and so for that reason, I hardly ever source from a big supermarket chain like Whole Foods. Instead, I spend a lot of time on Etsy or um, I, since I live in Oregon, there's a great store called Made in Oregon, which is it's kind of mainstreamish here in Oregon, but people outside the state have no idea what it is. Um, so I would suggest just checking out different resources in your state um, and then using Etsy. Etsy is a really good tool. Um, so what do you do with past boxes and excess inventory? I have, don't have any excess inventory. Um, I have, you know, maybe a couple products lying around here or there or a couple boxes. Um, but mainly I send all of my extra boxes to bloggers or influencers each month. If you want a good, a good explanation of that, um, you know, definitely check out Subscription School. We've gone over that in, in depth and detail. Check out the Prosperly Guide. Um, also, um, we, did a, we recently did a, a, a Ask Me Anything on Reddit. Um, which uh, you can find under the, under the entrepreneur section, which we went into a lot of detail about. Maybe I'll even include that link as a resource when we publish this uh, webinar on subscription school. Um, uh, so thank you for attending, Jake. Appreciate it. Um, so it is tobacco related. I tried the blog post idea to warrant my future subscribers. It seems like the fact that my blog was referring to tobacco products. Uh, you know, Shiv, if, if you're having a hard time uh, – if you guys are have, if you're having a hard time promoting, it just might be a fact of your niche. You know, it's it's really difficult. I know a lot of people have had trouble with this. Um, uh, maybe one thing that you can do is maybe do a promote a post to a landing page about something that's completely unrelated and host it completely separately from your site. So it's just cool, called like coolwebsite.com, and all this is a landing page um, that you know you gather emails on. If you're trying to boost posts on Facebook and it's not really getting through and they keep on canceling it. That, that could be my only advice. I don't know. Facebook is pretty smart. So, um, so last question here. Um, how often are you guys able to procure free product from suppliers? Any strategies you can give? So previously from Yogi Surprise and Prosperly and Escape Monthly and um, the previous boxes that we worked on together, James and I, our first company, Conscious Box, completely relied on free samples and free products. Uh, it's extremely difficult to scale your business like this. So what I would recommend is try to leave this strategy behind. Um, instead, increase your price by 5 or $10 and purchase these products at wholesale or as close to cost as possible from your suppliers. Um, this allows the, your curation to actually come through because you can actually buy products and choose what you're buying. Um, it also allows for a higher product quality. I mean, you're getting probably more full-size products, um, you know, things that are made in specific batches. Uh, you know, free product, I've had one or two vendors give me free product just because they really liked the idea. Um, but I wouldn't rely on it. It really depends on the business model that you're running with. And if you're running with a sample model, I, I would tell you right now that, you know, we scaled our business, you know, to tens and tens of thousands of, of subscribers and it became very difficult at the end of that. So avoid trying to source free product is, would be my advice. Um, uh, so that's the end of the questions. Um, so thanks, everybody, for attending this. If you have any other questions, feel free to shoot over to facebook.com slash createjoy or facebook.com slash subscription school, and we would be happy to answer those on the wall. If you have questions about how to do certain programming things and removing the self-cancellation option but keeping the, the skip option, uh, definitely email us at support at createjoy.com, and we can um, help you uh, take that out of your store. If you have any ideas for future webinars, please post that to our wall. Unfortunately, today um, we didn't get a poll set up in time, so we're not going to be able to ask you that poll at the end of this one. Um, but uh, you know, give us your feedback. Let us know what you thought. Um, and uh, again, thanks for attending. And this webinar will be up on subscriptionschool.com in the video section probably in the next one or two days here. Um, so good luck with everything, and don't forget your assignments. Go ahead out there, go reduce your churn, and do these action items. Um, set up your Zendesk, do your shortcuts. Gather information, create some standards, create a cancel list in MailChimp, and then create an automation and send out some emails. Um, thanks again. Have a great day, everybody.